Whoa, we got a full house, wonderful. Good evening, everybody. It's great to come home. Uh, Madam Chancellor, with your permission, we'll get underway here. The format is gonna be simple. I'm gonna introduce everybody to come up here. We'll do a bit of Q&A at the front. Uh, we'll then take your questions. We'll have a microphone set up right here so you'll make a line and come ask questions. We also are in the whole online world this evening and we will get some questions uh, from online social media as well this evening. And with that, let's get underway. First, I'd like to introduce you to the lead principal investigator of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging and a professor in your Department of Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics at McMaster University. Please welcome Dr. Parminda Reyna. Also joining us tonight, the Director of Geriatrics at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto and the Provincial Lead on the Ontario Senior Strategy, doing some very important work. Last time I talked to him was on TV, I believe. You were a guest on the agenda. Welcome Dr. Samir Sinha. Uh, she's the former Chief Economist and Executive Vice President of the Bank of Montreal, an author, been on television tons of times over the years, giving us all advice on what's happening macroeconomically speaking. Please welcome Dr. Sherry Cooper. You, you, you know, we really shouldn't say an introduction for you. We should really sing an introduction for you. Mmm, feeling fine, mama. Painted ladies and a bottle of wine, mama. Ooh, feeling good, mama. He took my money like I knew he would. Ian Thomas, right here. Come on up, Ian. I idolized this guy when I was coming up at CBC, uh, I, where I, you know, start... I guess it was 28 years ago I was working at CBC, and Brian Williams was the six o'clock sports guy. And then, from then on, I mean, my goodness, it's uh, 12 midnight in London, that'd be uh, three o'clock in the morning in Beijing. He became Mr. Olympics, uh, broadcaster for CBC and for TSN, Westdale Collegiate's own Brian Williams, right here. Okay, we want to start by putting this out here. Once upon a time, we all did one job for life. You got the job at the factory, you did it for 35 years, and you retired. And that was kind of it. And we all know that world hasn't existed for a long, long time. Now we have one career, and then maybe we'll have another, and then maybe we'll have another. And I want to start by asking Ian, you first. Which one are you in right now? I'm still singer-songwriter. But at this point in life, uh, with changing radio formats, my demographic is not really getting much airplay. I'm doing more live concerts. Uh, in, in the last 10 years, I've done more live concerts than I did in the previous 20. Fortunately for me, I diversified at a fairly, <laughs> a fairly young age, and film composition was uh, another area I branched out into. So I've, I've done about 25 movie scores now. So movie scores, singing, songwriting, and performing. Between the three of those, I managed to eke out an existence. The three of you have enjoyed, I think it's safe to say, a considerable degree of success in your respective fields. And I, I guess the next area I want to explore is why you haven't rested on your laurels and just sort of kicked up and called it a day. Because I'm having too much fun and I don't know what I would do. The two worst things in life at my age would be having to work if you don't want to or wanting to work and not being able to. You have to be as productive in retirement as you are, as you were, when you were working full time as a younger person. Let's get our doctors into this. Parminder, what evidence do we have that Canadians are delaying retirement and working longer? Uh, the, most of the evidence in relation to whether they are extending careers or they are changing careers comes from Statistics Canada. And if you look at the average age of retirement, that really hasn't changed much. It is, turns out to be around 62. But if you sort of go deeper into the data that you see that people are actually working longer because the averages hide the reality. And in, in 1997, let's say that uh, people worked roughly 14 years post-retirement. Whereas in 2010, that number has gone to 16 to 18%. So there is some evidence and trend that people are working longer. We have panelists here who are all successful, who are in the higher socioeconomic strata of uh, workforce. 
uh, they have choices that they can make, but data also shows that there are people who have to change careers uh, involuntarily. And those, those changes in careers are not necessarily happy and creative and, and uh, helpful there because they need money. There is a segment of the population who requires fun money to live. Well, that's and I there wondered. are others, but there are others who actually change careers because they find satisfaction in it. Samir, how does the status of your health determine whether or not you will go for that second career, third career, or extended career? I think the, the idea is that uh, when we actually look at what drives people to live longer um, or, or live more successfully, I think you know, our panelists represent this, con this concept that we've seen in, in, in aging research about having a sense of purpose, right? I mean, we've heard these three individuals talk about, you know, what drives them that sense of purpose, right? An economist, a broadcaster, you know, a musician and so on, and they will keep doing this because this is what they wake up wanting to do every day. So there's that aspect of, of when we think about what drives it. But we also think about the other aspects of our health. If we're healthy, we can still participate in, in, in various careers. If we're not healthy, that can limit the types of work we do um, and, and how, we, how well we can participate. The challenge that we have now is that uh, as we have more older people wanting to be participate in the workforce or having no choice but to stay in the workforce as well, those, that, those two dichotomies, the question is, are our workplaces actually are they receptive to an older audience and an older, older population? Let me get some evidence from the room. Yeah. Uh, we got a good cross-section of people here tonight, so let's just see. I'll give you an example of my own grandfather, my mother's father, who made umbrellas for a living and did it every day of his life until he was 80 years old, and then they sold the business and he retired. And within six months, he had a stroke and his life was never the same, and he died a year and a half later. How many people know somebody that happened to? Hands up. Yeah, that's a lot of folks. I've heard that over and over, that kind of example, Brian, where if you stop doing what you love, you, your life loses purpose, you lose your health. It, it does, but we have to accept part of the blame. We live in a, a society, you and I work in an industry where they want to go young. I say you don't go young, you don't go old, you go good. You, you, you can learn from the past, but we've got to stop living in the past. Sherry, how much of the reason why you do what you do still is rooted in the fact that you're nervous about what might happen to you if you stop doing what you well, love to I do? I was nervous when I was 25. I, you know, I've been nervous all my life. Very, very important. I mean, I, you know, I, if you're successful, you're paranoid because there's always somebody coming up behind you who wants to kind of push you under the bus. And, you know, it's well and good to say that, oh, the business community should create all these jobs for old people who have trouble moving or sitting or walking or whatever. But they're not going to do that unless they're forced to do it. And that wouldn't make any sense. It's, what ha it's a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately world. And the, you know, the average tenure of a CEO, you know, we only have data for the United States, is five years. In other words, someone who's at the very top of a company has no job security. My point is that no one has job security. Defined benefit pension plans are nearly extinct, right. especially in the private sector. They're, they're capping the pensions. They're reducing the pensions, and most businesses don't have them at all. We're going to have a lot more plus 65s over the next 10 years than we are going to have more 18 to 24 year olds. And my hunch is that the people who work in government and who want those votes will be making policies accordingly. So what do you think's in the offing? What's in the cards in terms of governments doing regulation changes, policy changes in order to help people work longer? And I've had many politicians now say, I'm really interested in this. And I'm like, why? seniors vote, right? <laughs> Hence why the parliament has uh, got rid of you know, mandatory retirement. 
why we're actually trying to talk about making workplaces more, uh, uh, why we're trying to accommodate people more as they age, for example, or just, just more people in our society. Um, this is why we've, the government has come up with a senior strategy. And if we don't actually reorient ourselves to the fact that we have an aging population, you know, this is what this whole event is about. It's optimal aging. And frankly, if our governments and, and our society isn't geared towards that, you know, we're not going to have places that we want to grow up and grow old in. Um, and they're not going to be optimal to live in or to work in. We've seen and we've heard tonight three examples from our three quote unquote real people about what optimal aging represents to them. I have a question here that came off social media, and maybe we could get our two doctors to weigh in on this as well. Uh, summarize in a few words, if you would, each of you in your own words. Samir, why don't you go first? What, what does optimal aging look like to you? For me, it's, it's you know, as, as, uh, as was being said before, it's, it's A, maintaining your health. You know, our, you know our, our health is absolutely important to so us. So it starts with good health. It starts with good health and, and good healthy practices that help us maintain, maintain our health. So not smoking, for example, you know, being moderate with some of your behaviors like alcohol, for example. But then it's about staying physically fit and that's also about being healthy, staying socially engaged and having a sense of purpose. I just have a general question about if you're seeing in the workforce um, that there's more contract work or accommodating people that maybe only want to work like six to nine months out of the year. Are you seeing any trends that way? Absolutely. I yeah. mean, the reason is because businesses don't have to pay contract workers benefits. Um, a lot of people have left their full-time job, people like me, who I need assistance, but I don't need full-time assistance. I want to pay people as freelancers. And because, you know, you can't just work for me if you want to work full time. So it gives, you know, the stay at home mom or the retired person who wants flexibility or the caregiver or whoever the opportunity to contribute. I think there's a huge market for that. Two quick comments. One, the person who said that aging is a state of mind never saw Bo Diddley naked. That's the first <laughs> comment. <laughs> if you pull the layers back on that, realizing where you are in life and what you may no longer should be doing is a good thing. Uh, and the second one uh, is from Woody Allen, actually. It's good to have distractions. <laughs> so we need I think as we get older, we need distractions. Love is a serious distraction, as is work. So both of these things are key distractions, which I think are the, the pillars of our, our mental health as we get older. Wonderful. That's a great place to leave it. Madam Chancellor, with, your, with thanks for your presiding over our wonderful panel this evening, I know all of you want to join me in thanking these five for a wonderful evening here at McMaster Innovation Park. Good stuff.